Hey Sylvia, thank you so much for coming on today. It's an absolute pleasure to have you on. It's delightful to be here, Melanie, and really looking forward to our conversation and where that might lead us. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so Sylvia, me and Sylvia have been connected across the years. We don't know each other um, very well at all, but somehow we've crossed similar paths. And more recently, I think I approached Sylvia about some coaching stuff and didn't realise Sylvia has is very much got her own coaching business and has done for a long time. Um, but it got us talking and then I realised she'd got her own podcast and, and I learned a little bit more about Sylvia and Sylvia has got her own podcast called Becoming More Significant. I've managed to listen to a couple of episodes, which I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I'm trying to remember the guy's name. It will come back to me. Um, I mean, he's, he is Superman, and you say that in the, in the podcast. He just does everything. Oh, um, well, there's quite a few of them, actually. Well, I guess there are, but... <laughs> I mean, there's Dan Keeley, who's a mental health expert. It was a more um, recent one. The more recent one. Was it Adrian Murphy? He's from, he's, he's not from UK. He, okay. I'm trying to think, he does NLP, he does Reiki, he does, he does the lot. He does, he's a healer. He almost, oh, Tony Salimi. Yes. Tony okay. Salimi. There he is go. awesome. How could I forget Tony? Yeah, he's yes. absolutely awesome. I, Brilliant I story. And, and yeah, I've known Tony for a while. In fact, I introduced him to the Professional Speaking Association that I'm part of. Um, and then we got to know each other a bit better and, and it was lovely because I only launched my podcast in January and he approached me and said really oh. like to support you why don't we have a chat and I thought that's great because you know he's a, he's a superstar he travels all over the world you know training coaching mega people and yet he gave up his time to, to have a chat with me and I so enjoyed that conversation he's a great guy. Oh. I thoroughly enjoyed it and I was like I want to approach him for mine but I don't know whether he's got the time so um so yeah and so so Sylvia has got her own podcast becoming more significant she's an author consultant coach speaker um probably other stuff I'm not aware of um but I I when I was looking at your website actually I was like oh my god so from the age of 13 you and your brothers ran a, a, a youth club for the disadvantaged kids in Glasgow. And I guess that's where you're originally from. Yes, indeed. Yeah. You can probably tell from my accent. You can yeah. tell <laughs> Glasgow, but you can't take Glasgow out of the girl. Um, and yes, I was brought up um, in a very strict Baptist family. Um, so quite a, a, quite a narrow upbringing in terms of my social and cultural development, but, but very loving but very much encouraged to spend our time in the church and in the church community. Even our leisure time, we were encouraged to, to do church activities and build friendships in the church. So, and that was fine when I, when I was young, but um, I rebelled a bit when I got into teenage years. But we can come on to that in a minute, because just to pick up on your question, my father and mother were asked to start a Baptist church in Castle Mill, which was a really deprived area of Glasgow. And it was rife with gang of warfare, broken homes. A lot of the young people were on drugs, the alcoholics, they were in and out of prison. And so my brothers and I just decided that on a Sunday night after the services my father was holding in the local school, we would just start like a coffee club and invite some of these troubled teenagers in somewhere that was safe, it was dry, they got, you know, free tea, coffee and, and people that would sit and listen to them without judging them. Yeah, uh, you know, and I, but I remember as young as 13 standing on a stage, a big stage in this school hall and talking about life and, and purpose and meaning. Um, and I look back at it now and I think, gosh, was I only 13? <laughs> <laughs> you don't think about it at the time, do you? You just do it, you just know? It, yeah. yeah. So yes. Yeah. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, in terms of, because I'm, I'm stepping in, finally stepping into coaching now, and but it's something I've done naturally all my life. You know, people have always gravitated to me, strangers telling me their deepest, darkest, you know, and all that. And, and like you just said, holding a space with no judgment is so powerful. So, but I didn't have the balls to do what you did at 13. I was very much a shrinking violet back then. Um, okay, so... What, what, I, what I always love my guests to do, um, because you know this podcast is all about people that aren't prepared to settle and, and you're clearly one of those people. Mm. So if Sylvia, if you um, grace us with uh, a little bit of your story in terms of where you've come from, obviously we've touched a little bit on that bit, um, but really 
also, you know, what was that pivotal moment? If there was a pivotal moment, there might have been a few, there might have been none, it might have just been who you are. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear sort of how you progressed in life and, you know, how you've become this big speaker and obviously a, a successful coaching business. I'd love to hear all about it. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for the space. And, and going back to what I was saying about that strict Baptist upbringing, you know, as a child, it was fine. It was, it was a vibrant community. There was always things going on. It was being part of a tribe. So, you know, it was, it was fitting that basic needs. However, you know, as I got into early puberty, 13, 14, I began to feel quite left out at school because my friends were then starting to go to the cinema on a Saturday. They were, they were going out with boys. They were wearing makeup, experimenting with miniskirts and all sorts of stuff. And then there was a local disco started and that was kind of the final straw for me because they were all going to this local disco. And I almost dreaded Monday mornings because they'd come, come to school and they'd all be chatting about who they'd dance with and who they'd kissed and, and all of that. And I started to feel really left out. And, you know, being left out of puberty is really tough. So I started to rebel and eventually got this grudging permission to go to this disco, um, but made to feel like I was going into the, the den of iniquity. <laughs> and, uh, I went three times and then on the third time, the inevitable happened. You know, I, I met a really good looking, charismatic, worldly wise guy and fell madly in love at the tender age of, of just, just under 15. Um, and he had a massive influence on me because he knew so much about the world and the affairs of the world and what was going on, things that we didn't really discuss at home. Um, and so he had a massive impact on me in those formative years between 15 and 20. But actually at 19, I married him, oh. just a child. And uh, as soon as I married him on the honeymoon, actually, I realized I'd made a mistake. Because now I was his wife, I was his possession, if you like, and uh, he wanted me to be the, the meek and mild little wife that, you know, did everything the way he wanted it done and, and, and agreed with his points of view and laughed at his jokes again and again and again. And, you know, I tried to adapt because in those days, marriage wasn't seen as disposable as it is now a days. It was, you, it, you'll have heard the phrase, you've made your bed, now lie in it. Um, and that used to ring in my brain when I was going through the tough times um, because he was he was a real mental bully, not a physical bully, but his raison d'etre became to keep me small. And at first uh, I used to try and assert myself and, and step out above the parapet, but it would ensue, you know, it would just cause days and sometimes weeks of just total silence. And I found that agonizing, you know, I can still remember that not in my stomach when I'd hear his key in the lock and think, oh, what's it going to be like tonight? And, and very often it was just silence. And very often I wouldn't know what I'd done to provoke this silence. So what happened was that I found it was easier just to shrink. And I shrank to, to such a stage that, you know, I was just living a, a shadow of the life I should have been. And I remember that time so clearly when I was in my darkest space, you know, I was desperately unhappy, um, but the overriding feeling, emotion was shame because I looked back at that young girl, that 13 year old girl standing on that big stage, talking to those troubled teenagers about life and purpose and meaning. And here was I living a life that was barely significant in any way. And I vowed then that when I got out of that situation, because deep down I knew I would eventually, it took me a long time, but I knew I would eventually and about that then what I wanted to do when I got out was to help people that had been suppressed for whatever reason to actually reconnect with themselves, reconnect with the core value we all possess and, and to peel back some of those layers of limiting beliefs that are built up over the years through things like tough relationships and, and to live a life of more fulfillment and more purpose. And it took me a while to get there. Um, because at the time I was a nursing sister, I was, um, I was a theatre sister in open heart surgery, um, but I actually became so ill and I'm sure it was the stress that caused it. I ended up with glandular fever and hepatitis and I had to take six months out. And during that six months out, I decided that actually nursing wasn't my long term career. I needed to carve a pathway for myself, run my own business. And then fast forward many years, I... Um, I I got into uh, pharmaceutical sales because I, I ran a health business um, and then I sold that as a going concern. And because I had medical experience and health experience, 
I was a prime target for working in the pharmaceutical industry. They were really looking for people with medical backgrounds to, to work with doctors and consultants and things um, on the sales side. So that's when I kind of got my grounding in sales and marketing and business growth uh, and all of that. Um, and then through several other careers, just developed that, that skill and leading teams, et cetera. Um, and then um, more recently, um, what I've been doing is running my coaching business. And, and that came about because I was running several networking groups for business women. And I was doing a lot of coaching and training and mentoring anyway. Um, and then I trained in psychometrics and I thought, well, A, I'm going to be working in companies with teams and B, I'm already working with a lot of women. I need to have a coaching qualification. So that's when I went and studied coaching and uh, got that qualification. And since then, I've just continued to learn and grow and become accredited in different areas. Because as you know, uh, Mel, the more that you learn and grow, the more you've got to offer your clients. And in coaching, it's just wonderful to have all those tools and methodologies at your fingertips that you can just pull out when it's needed um, and really enhance what you're doing with clients. Um, and when I did the psychometric, um, I came out as a star profile. That was Talent Dynamics at the time. Um, I've moved on now to another one called Contribution Compass, which is very similar. But in Talent Dynamics terms, I was a star profile. And what that showed me was what I already knew, but it confirmed that when I'm most in flow, as in when I'm really having most impact and feeling really aligned with what I'm doing, it's when I'm training or when I'm speaking. So I thought, okay, well, I'm already doing quite a lot of this because I, you know, I'm running all these networking groups. I'm speaking at them every month, but I'm sure I could stretch. And that's when I joined the Professional Speaking Association. I thought this is going to stretch me and boy, did it. Because I remember going along to the first meeting and hearing um, a speaker, a phenomenal speaker who was an ex uh, TV presenter, another speaker who's part of the magic circle. And while he was delivering his business talk, he was weaving magic into what he was doing at the same time. <laughs> and I sat there and I thought, oh, my God, I thought I could speak. This is a whole different ball game, And it felt really scary because I honestly thought, what can I possibly say that's going to impact on these really high profile, um, you know, and highly engaged speakers. Um, but, you know, I believe in being scared regularly. So I thought, no, I'm going to push myself. So I did. And after a couple of months of, of being a member, I then volunteered to, to speak. And again, that was a real stretch. But I thought, if I don't do it, I'm just going to sit here and listen. And what's the point in doing that? Yeah. So that that was my stretch. And I did that a few times and then eventually delivered a keynote. And, and now I teach people to speak. So, you know, I'm a great believer in when you feel scared, it's a sign that you're growing, you're stretching and you're growing. So welcome the fear and recognize the fear. Feel it. Don't just stuff it down. Feel it. But then rise above it and when you do it just feels amazing you know what it's like when you've done something you were scared about afterwards the adrenaline rush is just yeah. it's amazing yeah yeah so that's a very long answer to your question <laughs> well no um thank you that was very insightful so what what do you think because obviously you know you were you said you were from a strict upbringing um, mm. You wanted to help well you were you were encouraged by that sort of upbringing to to help the disadvantaged kids but it was something that was in you anyway yeah and then you ended up in a marriage that you quickly realized was a mistake um what do you think was that obviously you wanted to get out of that marriage which you did what what do you think was the driving force for you then to continue to to grow and build and become a speaker and a coach and a consultant and i'm doing these psychometric tests um what what do you is there something that's like just in you or do you think it's circumstances that pushed you I think a lot of it was my upbringing um because you know we were brought up in in the Baptist church that you know life was all about serving others and you know from a very very young age um we were encouraged to speak at Sunday school and from a very young age I was running a bible study group for some of the the young young women or young girls in the church so you know I must have been about 12 13 when I was doing that as well so and I absolutely loved being able to help others to learn and to grow and to see them stepping up and becoming more of the people that they were born to be so 
it's kind of been something that has been in me from that very, very young age. And I think it's, it's seeing the difference that you can make when you are in service to other people, when it's not about you, it's about them. And it's about how can, how can they live a life where they feel that they're living life on purpose and they're feeling fulfilled and life is full of joy. And it's not just about getting through every day and, and working every day and earning enough to live, that there is so much more to life than that. But I think that was very much reinforced when I was in that place where I shrank and I felt so insignificant and so ashamed of the life that I was living and I vowed that I would never ever be in that space again and having experienced that feeling and, and it's almost a paralysis you know people say well why didn't you leave earlier but because I'd met him when I was 15 or just before my 15th birthday and because I was with him all that time he had a massive hold on me and he used to make me feel that he used to say that I wouldn't survive without him he said it so often that I believed it and yeah. And because I had been so young when he came into my life, I honestly didn't know whether I could survive on my own. I honestly didn't know whether I could carve out a life for myself and support myself. It was really scary. Um, and I did try and leave. I mean, I left five times and each time he came with his charisma and charm and promised to change and all the rest of it and drew me back into the web. And, you know, you think you'd learn, but it took a lot of time and effort. And I, you know, I kept saying to myself, when I get out of here, what I want to do is help other people who've been suppressed. And then when I when I was obviously nursing was was great because I was really able to help people that yeah. fulfilled that need. It was wonderful. I love nursing. Um, the reason I moved on was that I got to a level where if you if you go any higher in the nursing profession, you become a nursing officer and therefore your day is very much filled with admin and reports. And, and that's not what I went into nursing for. I wanted to work with people. Yes, yeah. so that was why I moved on. But, um, you know, doing what I'm doing now and, and, you know, starting to run networking groups, which was my my sort of step into um, doing coaching and everything that I do now, I just saw the vulnerability of women, you know, women who had had really high powered jobs in corporates and then they'd taken the career break for kids and they might have been out of the, of the workplace for, you know, three, four or five years, sometimes longer. And then they decided they didn't want that corporate life. They wanted to be around to pick the kids up from school. And so they reinvented themselves and they launched their own business. And when they would come to me, they were very new into that business. They had several, several years out of the business world and they were frankly floundering. In yeah. fact, just even coming networking was a big stretch for them. Yeah. Um, and I loved being able to support them and help them and offer mentoring and training and then just watch them as they gradually stepped up and started to blossom and started to make some great business connections through the network and then seeing their business flourish got such a buzz out of that and, and that's just spurred me on then to develop my coaching business to learn and, and the profiling was if I can profile my members they're going to have so much better uh, indication of where to focus their time and energy and how to be more in flow um i used to run workshops for groups of members around that whole being in flow playing to your strengths etc um and then workshops on personal impact and personal presence developing your confidence and i've pulled all of that now into my becoming more significant six-week program and um, so you know i'm using all that stuff that i've built up over the years and and delivered over the years and, and seen the impact of, of over the years and absolutely loving now delivering it in one program which yeah. was launched in lockdown funny yeah. enough <laughs> wow and um, before we get on to that so just to sort of how old were you when you finally left that marriage you know when you I was 29 wow right okay a long time I was married for 11 years Crikey. So you knew straight away, but it took that. I mean, I can relate to that. You know, I, I, I was um, I was with somebody for 12 years and, you know, I think a year into being married. Well, I, I, I've talked about it before on the podcast, but there was a pivotal moment for me where it was recognised that I was deeply unhappy by my acupuncturist. And she was reflecting back to me what I deep down knew, but couldn't admit. Mm. You know, but she um she was able to smash the, oh, so smash the sledgehammer over my head um and crack it open um but it still took time after that for me to finally leave because that the guilt and, and every other emotion that's associated 
keeps you firmly where you don't want to be. Um, so, wow. So it took you to 29 to finally break free. Yeah. Were you still nursing up to that point? Um, no, I was running my health food business. Um, I'd been very ill at 27. That was when I had the glandular fever and, and the hepatitis. And um, as part of my recovery, I went down to the local health food shop to get tonics and all the rest of it. And then, then the guy that owned it said, look, you know, while you're recovering, why don't you do come in and just do a couple of hours in the afternoon? It will get you out. I know you're really interested in health. So that's what I did. And then he said to me one day, I'm actually selling. Would you be interested? And that's how it happened. <laughs> just that yeah, serendipity. Okay. Happened that's to be in the right place at the right time. But coming back to your, your point about it taking me so long, um, I don't know, are, are you familiar with gaslighting, Mel? Do you know, I've seen that phrase so many times over the last couple of weeks, but I don't fully understand what it is. So if you okay. would educate me, yeah. Well, it comes from a film and um, in the film, um, I think it might have been Gregory Peck that was the key one. Anyway, um, he is gaslighting his wife. In other words, he is making her feel totally dependent on him by making her feel that she's going slightly mad. And um, there's a scene in the film where he has rigged up the lights in the attic to just flash off and on, off and on, off and on. And they're sitting downstairs and she said, why are the lights flashing? And he says, he says well, what do you mean? There's no lights flashing. And there's several examples of him doing that. And it was to make his wife dependent on him. And, you know, I've just finished writing um, the first draft of my book on becoming more significant. And in that I write about gaslighting because having researched it and read it, I know that that's what my husband was doing to me, not, not in such a dramatic form, but it was making me feel that I could not depend on him. And he was doing me down so often. He was telling me what was wrong with me and things like, you know, our friends only saw us because of him. I had nothing to say. I had nothing to add and all that kind of thing. And when somebody's telling you that consistently over the years, you start to believe it. Yeah. Um, and then you do become dependent on them, which is why I felt I couldn't possibly um, be on my own. And when I did leave, he would always say, look, you and I were meant to be together. You know, we were. And, you know, we've got this deep bond and, you know, I love you and I'd never harm you and all the rest of it. And, you know, when I look back on it now, I think, gosh, I was so, so vulnerable and so gullible. But then I was in a very vulnerable state because he was just very gently and gradually gaslighting me. Now, he probably didn't know he was doing it. But when I read about it, I thought that's exactly what he was doing. You know, so that's why it took me so long. Yeah. Thank you for that, because, uh, as I say, I keep seeing this. Um phrase being used I think it's you know with what's happening in the world and all that sort of thing but yes. um and I didn't fully appreciate what that was so that's mm. that's education thank you and and I'm sure a lot of women um listening not just women men um as well listening to that will relate you know could relate on some on some level so so 29 you leave the marriage you've already got your health business you then how long did you keep the health business before you sold it um, about three years. Um, when I left the marriage, I thought I just need, I went back to it for a little while and I thought I need a complete change now. I just need to get away. I mean, I was very fortunate in that I'm very close to my older brother and um, I'd gone to live with my mum and he, he came to me and said, look, you know, you're 30 years old, you shouldn't be living with mum. Why don't you come and live with me and my wife? And, and, you know, it's a bit of a younger atmosphere and all the rest of it. And so I did. I went to live with them for a little while. Um, but I found that even though I was 30, they kind of wanted to know what time I was coming in at night and all that sort of stuff. And I thought, do you know what? I've been married 11 years. I think I just need a complete break. So I deliberately applied for a job in pharmaceuticals, which was based in the south of England. Right. And I thought, I'm just going to have a complete change. And, and that's what I did. And I ended up um, moving right down to Sussex. I mean, right, you know, the bottom of the country, <laughs> really far away from Glasgow. And um, and then had to cope with the culture there, which was, if you're, if you're listening and you're from Sussex, I apologise. But in those days, you had to be formally introduced to somebody before they would speak to you. And I found that so strange coming from somewhere like Glasgow, where if you stand next to somebody, you know, in the station or, you know, a bus stop or something, you know, their life history within five minutes. <laughs> the culture shock was quite something, but, but it was good for me to have space on my own and, and time just to refine myself well, well well to find myself actually yeah. and, and, and find out who who I was and, and what I wanted in life so you know I look back on it as 
really necessary time in my life. I had five years before I married my second husband and I so needed that time because I'd gone yeah. straight from, you know, 15 year old to this long marriage to, you know, and suddenly here I was free and there was no way I was going to get tied down anytime soon. Wow. Okay. And then in terms of, so, um, so then you married five years later. Um, when did you make the transition from pharmaceutical sales to, you said you ran your own networking. How did that come about? Yeah, well, I took, um, because of the, the illness that I'd had at 27, um, unfortunately, the glandular fever didn't leave my system, which I didn't know. Right. And I was in quite a high powered um, sales job after pharmaceuticals, I went into quite a high powered sales job. And we were on a sales conference in uh, Istanbul and did the usual went to the spa and everything. Yeah. And or the Turkish baths, I should say, and got back and developed a really, really nasty bout of flu where I honestly thought my days were numbered. Um, and then that developed into ME or what it's now called post viral fatigue syndrome. And I had to just completely stop working. It just absolutely floored me. And when I eventually got some help from a naturopath, she found this glandular fever was still in my system. And that is one of those viruses that sticks around, can stick around for your whole life. So she was able to treat me with um, oh, diet advice and, and lots of homeopathic remedies and some uh, cranial osteopathy, and all sorts of wonderful treatments. And within about three months, I was about 70% better, but not well enough to go back and establish my career. So I, uh, the next year, um, I got married to my husband and very quickly got pregnant. And so I took a few years out to have my kids and just to be with them. Yeah. Um, and then when I came back into the workplace, a friend of mine said, look, I'm really looking for someone to do some business development for me. Why don't you come and join me? So I joined her and she said, I really want you to go networking. And I'd never been networking before, didn't have a clue what it was um, and, and just fell in love with it, joined a local network. And within a few months, they, they approached me and said, Sylvia, um, we're actually franchising out the network. We're looking for people like you to run networking groups for business women. Would you be interested? And I bit their hand off. I thought, wow, that is perfect. Just what I'm looking for. And I'm going to be able to have a real positive impact on women like me who are a bit lost after that career break, don't know where to go, don't know how to position themselves, feel out of touch with the world and business, et cetera. I'm going to be able to help them because I've been there and I know what it feels like. And I'd grappled for a while with what I was going to do next. So um, it was perfect. And again, it's serendipity, right place, right time, meant to be. That's what I was just thinking. Um, mm. It feels like even though you came from, you know, that, that sort of 10, 11 years of, of being in a, you know, let's be honest, a shit place. Yeah. The rest of it has flowed. Even though you've had ill health, that's happened for a reason as well, because it's made you stop. It's given, mm. given you the space. It's given you different direction. Um, and absolutely, that's, I've been thinking this all the way through the conversation. It's just serendipitous. It's the universe. Yeah. It's, it's just those you. Yeah, yeah, it's like you said at the beginning, what are the defining moments? That was definitely a defining moment for me because I was in this um, high pressured sales environment, but loving it, doing extremely well. I was just about to have my most lucrative year ever and then bang. And, and by the way, that didn't include kids. So my, my second husband actually married me thinking that I wasn't going to have kids, even though he wanted them. So, you know, I always respected him for that. Wow. Um, but my life, because I was on that fast track and I was just, you know, life was great and earning great money, driving a top of the range car and all the bit, you know, and I, I thought, I don't think my life includes kids. I think I'll be happy just just doing this. Um, but of course, the universe had other plans. And now I've got two gorgeous daughters who I wouldn't be without for anything. So, you know. oh, wow. Um, that gave me goosebumps. That's lovely. Um, so, so you started running these network events and then how did that then lead? I mean, the network events I've tried like, cause I, you know, I was in corporate sales um, 20 odd years and I've tried the breakfast networking and all that. And I, I hated it, Sylvia, I've got to be honest. I really hated it I, because people were just standing up and saying the same old thing every week, you know, and it's just like, Whoa, what am I getting from this? But obviously you saw it differently and you've got a different skill set to me. Um, so how did that then progress to 
um, going into, um, you talked about the uh, wealth dynamics yeah. and the, the coaching. So how did that progress into that? Were you just running networks? Was that a full-time business for you at the time? And then it progressed? Yeah. Yeah. It, well, it was a full-time business because um, the way the franchise worked was that you, you purchased a postcode area and your commitment was to open four groups within that postcode area within 18 months. But after launching my first two groups, I thought, I absolutely love this. I want to do this full time because at the time I was still doing business development um, for my friend's company. Um, and so I bought a second franchise and I opened six groups in six months, which was nuts. And then I waited for a year and then opened my last two groups. So I ran eight groups for nearly 10 years. So as you can imagine, that was full time. <laughs> so I was not only running the groups and, and obviously marketing them and, and networking to fill them, but I was also running um, uh, workshops as well. The workshops on how to network more effectively, how to build a more personal, uh, stronger personal presence. And I became the, the sales director for, for the um, organization, the, the network. And I was very involved in the conferences and I emceed um, the last conference I was at. And one of our speakers was the MD of Talent Dynamics. Yeah. And we were pretty blown away with the whole Talent Dynamics profiling. And I thought this would be fabulous for the network. And so the CEO and myself and a couple of the other um, directors all went on a training course in Talent Dynamics and trained to be consultants in this psychometric testing. And that gave me a big switch because as I said earlier, then I thought, right, well, I'm going to be using this not only with the network, but also with teams because it's a fabulous tool for teams. Therefore, I will need to have some formal coaching qualifi qualification, even though I'd been coaching, mentoring people for most of my life. So that's when I went to the coaching academy and studied coaching, um, did a diploma in NLP. And then each year I've studied some other aspect of coaching, training or whatever, just to add to that knowledge. So that's how I got into that and stayed using that within the network and, and, and with teams for a while until it got to the stage where I really felt I really wanted to do more with senior people, senior execs, teams, etc. So I sold one franchise and then a year later sold the other franchise and transitioned into full time just being working for myself as a coach, a speaker, a trainer, etc. Um, and that's why I do now, which has been brilliant during lockdown, because, of course, everything I do, I can do on Zoom. Yeah. Yeah. Like we are right now. Exactly. <laughs> Amazing platform. I know. Yeah, it's it's unbelievable. Um, wow. I mean, I think um, listening to your story and, and the ambition, you know, that you've clearly got and has taken you from one level to the next, to the next, to the next. In terms of. I'm always fascinated with how people do it. You know, like you were a nurse, so I guess you weren't earning great money back then. Um, but somehow you then transitioned into buying this health business, which then transitioned into you moving on and, and, and up and up and up to whatever the universe presented to you. For people that are listening that are potentially stuck in a relationship they're not happy in or stuck in a job that is just paying the bills, like a lot of people do, you know, um, what would you, what would your advice be or not? I don't like the word advice, but you know, in terms of any guidance for people, because there are a lot of people feeling trapped out there. Mm -hmm. COVID and the, and the pandemic has created a lot of unemployed people, people that are probably scratching their heads and got chaos and just have no idea what they're going to do next. Mm. Um, and, and uh, probably lacking money, you know, to be able to think that they could even start their own business. Mm. So what would you say to people like that that are feeling trapped or confused and don't quite know what, what step to take, I suppose? Sure. Well, I think when you're in that position, particularly, you know, if there's lack of funds, because obviously, you know, if, if funds aren't an issue, then, you know, I'd be saying, you know, spend some time with a coach and a mentor. Yeah. so that they can really help you to get clarity on where your strengths lie and what your values are and therefore what you're going to be most aligned with going forward but I think if if you know money's tight and, and you can't do that then see it as a transition so that you're not leaving one job into another but you're gradually building up strength in another area so you know just think back to when have you been most happy in your life when have you been most aligned with what you are doing what is it that that fires you up 
And how could you do more of that? Because that's when you're going to be in flow. And, you know, even if you if you are a bit short of cash, take a profile test. You know, what a profile uh, like Talent Dynamics, like Contribution Compass will really help you to see where your natural strengths lie. Um, and I'm, I'm not doing this as a sales thing, but on my website, you can actually take the Contribution Compass profile um, for just 50 pounds. And it gives you so much clarity on where your natural strengths lie. And then you can start looking at how you could engage those strengths. Because when you're playing to your strengths, when you're in flow, it sparks up your creativity. It sparks up ideas you would never have otherwise. And it energizes you and it gives you the confidence then to make that move. And once you know where your strengths lie, start to develop those skills. And if you think about it, we've never been served as well as we are now with ways to learn and grow. I mean, you just go on YouTube and there are videos on every kind of skill you could possibly want. TED Talks will inspire you to step up. The webinars that are going on. I mean, I ran a webinar last night for 198 people on becoming more significant. And that didn't cost them a penny. It was part of a networking thing. And I did it for free because I like to do that. Yeah. So, I, you know, I got lots of messages this morning and people were saying, you really inspired me to take action. So the more you can tap into things like that, that are going to spur you into action, get you thinking in the right way and give you the inspiration to actually learn a bit more about who you are and where you want to be in life, then that's the start. But see it as a start. Obviously, you've got to earn money while you're transitioning. And um, when I, as I mentioned earlier, when I took on the network, I was still working as a business development director. I desperately wanted to just focus all my time and energy on the network, but I knew there had to be that transition period, which is always painful because you really want to get involved in the new shiny thing rather than the old. But, you know, just to do it gradually, it's much less scary and it's much more practical, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've done both. I'm, I'm currently, I was made redundant. Um, well, I found out I was being made redundant last May and I decided, and I, I was approached about this, um, going through this accreditation for the coaching at the same time, it was literally within 24 hours. And I saw that as the universe kicking me up the ass to say, Mel, come on, yeah. it's about time. <laughs> um, and so I've chosen not to get another job and mm. I've managed to wing it so far. <laughs> um, but, you know, I, I do agree with you because a few years ago when I tried to do it and I didn't have a job and I was trying to do various things, the pressure of having nothing coming in just completely wiped me. Mm. And um, it was not productive at all. So, um, no, I, I, I totally resonate with everything you've just said then. There is so much information out there for people. Mm. I think it can be overwhelming. And I, and I think that's where the coach or the mentor comes in into its own because you need to hone in but I'm really I'm really interested in the the psychometric stuff so I remember doing wealth dynamics I can't remember what I was um and naturally as a person I think I always avoid I always use the word structure I'm a bit airy fairy whatever and I like to go by the seat in my pants and I and I think I always feel like psychometrics kind of box me and I don't want to be boxed. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm interested, uh, you're very enthusiastic about them and, 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 and I get what you're saying, but on, on the other side of it, so what, what, I, what my coaching is, is, is all about establishing people's core values, their vision, their mission. Mm -hmm. And obviously I wholeheartedly believe that once you know what your core values are, you're, you are able to then develop what that vision looks like and, and how you're going to achieve it. How do you think just having that differs to the psychometric stuff? Great question, Mel. Fantastic question. And um, I'm going to, to just pick up on the fact that you don't want to be put in a box. That is the first thing I say when I'm running team sessions. I say, I literally say, this is not about labeling you. It is not about putting you in a box. It's about giving you a framework yeah. of strengths, challenges, communication styles so that we can have an open and frank discussion about what resonates with you and what doesn't. It's a conversation opener. So I always say it's not about labeling. And I always, I always also say my job's not to persuade you that you are the profile that you've come out with as a result of this test. My job is, is to find out where do you feel most in flow? The test is just a method of you relating to what it's saying and saying, yes, that's me or no, that's not me. And then let, we can have a more informed discussion. 
So in my Becoming More Significant program, that is the first masterclass, but the fourth masterclass is values. And I do a values exercise like you do and aligning people with their values and seeing what resonates with the most and which is most aligned to the different tasks that they do, because that's much deeper. You know, yes, you can know what your strengths and challenges are, but you've got to also be aligned with your values. So the two together really um, complement each other and reinforce that real feeling inside you of, yes, this is right for me, or actually, no, that's not right for me. So it's not an either or for me, it's both. That's actually really interesting. And I, yeah, I totally get that. Um, the reinforcement of one with the other. And like you say, it's not a, it's not a, here you go, here's your label, get on with it. It's a, what resonates here and what doesn't and take what resonates and then you match it with your core values. And, and hey, presto, the core values is one thing, but I guess the, the psychometric test is more about defining where you could go with that. Absolutely. Absolutely. In a nutshell. And I've got to say, when I did my talent dynamics profile back in 2012, I can still remember reading it and the hairs on the back of my neck standing up and being goosebumps all over and thinking, oh, my God, how did they know so much about me from a <laughs> test? You know, it was absolutely me to a T. Now, it doesn't always happen like that particularly if people have been um, in a role for a long time where they're actually out of flow. And so they've answered the questions very much from where they are now. But if after that they go on and have some coaching and mentoring, et cetera, and they get back into flow, when I profile them again, they'll have switched just probably one place around the, around the compass to where they're naturally more in flow. Because we lose sight of our strengths when we're out of flow all the time. Yeah. And when we're being that proverbial jack of all trades, and we just carry on on that pathway because that's our job. It's what we've learned to do. And a lot of people just don't get the, the whole joy of working in flow because we're brought up to believe the only way to succeed is to work hard. So those two words are synonymous in our brain. Work is hard. So if I'm not very happy at work, well, that's just the status quo, you know? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Sylvia, do you know what? I've absolutely loved this conversation. Um, oh, <laughs> yeah, you, you're massively, massively inspirational in terms of what you've been through and, and where you're at now and, and what your vision is and what you've achieved. Um, if there's any final words you would like to say, and I also um, uh, would like um, to, for you to say where people can find you if they want to reach out to you as well, but if there's any final words that you would like to say to the listeners, um, any pearls of wisdom, anything at all, what would it be? Okay. <laughs> Lovely. Okay. Well, first of all, I'll tell you where you can find me. So it's really easy. I'm just sylvia at sylviaball.com or my website is sylviaball.com and I'm all over social media. So do connect with me. I love new connections and, and getting to know pe new people. Um, and my, my final words of wisdom are in line with this podcast, don't settle. You know, beyond wherever you are right now lies an infinite well of potential that we're all only scratching the surface of. Yeah. And, you know, dive into that well of potential. It's the most exciting, exhilarating journey you will ever take in your life. And there's no time like the present to do it with all the challenges we've been through with the pandemic, the pandemic which facing our mortality. Don't get to the end of your days and wish that you dived into your potential and regret the life you've lived. Live it now. You have nothing to lose. Live life to the full and you'll experience such joy and such fulfillment. It, you, you'll just feel amazing. Wow. Wow. Thank you. Um, well, thank you so much, Sylvia, for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Mel. And really great to get to know you better. We'll yeah. talk again. Likewise. Yeah, definitely. Take care. Bye-bye.